Hello everybody, welcome to another Valheim video. Today I have an interesting discussion for you with Dakar, a master builder. One of the two main builders for the adventure map, alongside with Nine Bytes. We'll be learning all about Dakar's story, but before we get into that, he'll start with some advice for those of you who like to do more complex building. Dakar will make some fascinating points about the silhouette of the building, using reference materials, and the ratios of different elements used in the building. You'll find all of that and more during this audio discussion with Dakar. I hope you enjoy your listen. Today, uh, I've got an interview for you with Dakar. Is that how I pronounce your name? Yeah, that's uh, perfect, actually. Oh, oof, uh, maybe that's the first time I've pronounced something right. I can't even get Valheim right. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? Uh, it's very good. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's been it's been such a blast to be able to give people a chance to talk about their passion for this game. And uh, I'm really excited to, to get into this because you, you've done so many incredible things that have really enabled a lot of other people to play Valheim in ways that they don't even know. Like, as, as far as I know, I mean, you, you guys essentially made a game using Valheim. <laughs> we certainly tried, yeah. No, I mean... Um... Yeah, I, I absolutely love this game, and uh, for a long time now, a lot of enjoyment from it has come from pushing the limits and finding out what you can do with it. And one of the best parts for me is then teaching that or showing that to other people, and I get to relive the joy of discovering that it, through their eyes as well. Yeah. So it's very addictive. Oh, absolutely. That's that's how I felt with Expand World Prefabs. It's like, shit, it just added another thousand hours to that. Yeah. So so before I get started with your history, um, Speed from the, the Valheim World Editing Group had a question about how you go about builds. So his question to read it... Actually, no, sorry, it wasn't Speed Locked. It was Zeal Gaming. His question okay. is, please ask what is Dakar's thought process when he wants to build something complex and tips and tricks to ho go about building or building them. I, I think he's more talking about how you plan out the builds, not so much yeah. how you actually do the build, right? Well, that, that is what I would say is the most crucial part. And a lot of the time you have to take a kind of an abstract view to planning these things when you're building something unusual or, or complicated. Um, I would say the first step that a lot of people skip, and I've definitely been guilty of this in the past, and it comes back to bite you, is you need to gather reference images, because no matter how familiar you think you are with something, the brain is very good at filling in details that you don't actually know about. Like, if you were to think about building a car, everyone looks at cars every single day, but when you come to build it, you're going to come across questions like, how far apart are the wheels, length compared to width? how much body is in front and behind the car, like all kinds of things that you kind of think you know intuitively, but it really helps to have a picture there to be able to reference. Um, so that would be something I'd say is really important. Um, the next thing that ties into that as well is silhouette is more important than details, and it's harder to adjust later. Um, it's very easy to get the silhouette right when you start because you can build a very basic shape and just check, is it too tall? Is it too fat? How does it look? Um, and you can use these reference images to measure out a very rough indicator. So if we're sticking with the car, you can draw a line the length of the wheel and then measure how many wheels tall is it? How many wheels wide is it? Um, and, and use that to maintain the correct proportions and scale, and that's going to keep your silhouette really consistent and smooth and nice, no matter what scale you build it to. Um, so I would say that is, is very important. And then that does tie into the scale. So something I often look for when I'm looking to recreate something or, or build a complicated thing is I look for what the smallest detail is that I want to replicate and I think about how would I build that in Valheim. 
So it might be something circular, and then I need to work out, hmm, building with the correct sort of texture or piece, what's the smallest circle that I can build to replicate this? And then from that, you can extrapolate how big the rest of it should be. And focusing on those like small details, or maybe it's the hardest part of the builds to replicate, focusing on those and then extrapolating from that stops you from running into those problems where you've maybe built a whole statue and you get to the head and you realize, hmm, I can't do eyes because they're going to be too small and it's going to look all wrong. Uh, yeah. So that would kind of, I guess, summarize my like three step planning, like references, uh, silhouette, and then scale. So just, just to make sure I understand you correctly, when you, when you say silhouette, you're talking about not so much like, like the details of the structure, but it's outline, it's, it's edge. Exactly. Yeah. Um, oh, that's interesting. I, yeah, it, it's a it's a tricky one to wrap your head around at first, but the more you think about it, the more it makes sense. Like if you imagine taking a picture or a screenshot of the, the nicest thing you've built, and then you just paint over all of the details black. It's just a black. Does it still look good? You know, and on your best builds, the answer will often be yes. And on your builds that you're like, ah, it's something not quite right about it. The answer is often no. Um, and when you look at um, some of the most popular screenshots, if you were to go onto the Steam community for Valheim and look at like highest rated screenshots, and they're, they're mostly things from when the game you know launched and was extremely popular. There's a lot of funny meme builds on there of like Thomas the Tank Engine, and the details are terrible, but they don't matter. It's got the silhouette of a train and it's got a troll head on the front so people knew it was Thomas the Tank Engine. You know, that's, that's the kind of thing that I'm, I'm getting at. Oh, that, that's fascinating. I had honestly never... Like, I haven't built anywhere near as much as a lot of other Valheimers, but I'd never even, I'd never even conceptualized like, thinking about the outline of the silhouette of the building. So <laughs> that's, that, that's really cool. And so, so then to one of your other points... It sounds like when you're talking about reference images, the useful information in the reference images is the ratios. Is that right? Yes. Like yes, how exactly. And and with the example of the car, that makes a lot of sense because if if the car the car needs the wheels to be the right uh, basically percentage of the full silhouette, right? And if you make them too mm -hmm. small, it won't activate that imagery in your head of a car, right? Yeah. It'll and if look they're like too a big. Part. Yeah, exactly. And if it's too big, it'll be like a tractor or, or something. Exactly. Right? Yeah. 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 So oh, that, that's really interesting. So, so let's say to uh, to to help uh, Zeal's point here. One second. So basically, when you're talking about reference material, you don't just want something that's inspiring. You want things that you can basically like maybe draw little outlines on and measure the ratios and see like okay how much of the door is the height of the building, right? Like how exactly. many doors could you stack on to make the height? And then you have to keep that in your build to make sure that it sort of maintains that, uh, that magic. Yeah, you've got it 100%. And I'll be able to send you some, some pictures for you to show where I've, I've done this on projects and I have them saved where there's loads of red lines over the build measuring tons of different things. And I have a document of the scale of those lines, you know, to, to work out the ratio of how big that line is compared to the original line. Um, and it, it does get very nerdy at times, but it, doing it in those ratios, like you describe, makes it a lot easier to track in your head rather than thinking, okay, the width is 10 and a half meters and the height is 13.2 and now I need to scale it up 50% and then you, you know, forget all that, work in wheels. Yeah, especially if you're doing that after the fact, that's like, it's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let's say, let's look at like an average build you're making, whatever that is. And how much of the time would you say is before you actually build stuff in Valheim? 
compared to the time you actually spend building? Hmm. Um, that is a tricky one to answer because I have gotten quicker at the the planning stage because I I figured out these things over time by running into the problems and then thinking hmm what could I have done to never run into this situation in the first place um, so I have gotten better at that and, and quicker at it um, but I wouldn't say that diminishes the importance of it well theoretically you've also gotten quicker at building right um I have, but I don't think maybe at the same rate. Like, there's there's almost a, a, a ceiling to how quick you can get a building, I would say. Yeah, that um, makes sense. I think the other, the other thing I want to say about reference images is having a variety of styles. And the most obvious one to me for, for when this was really important was for when I built the, um, the Deathwing recreation, the dragon from, from World of Warcraft. Uh, there I had some reference images that were drawn by artists, which were you know beautifully detailed with every little crevice on every scale, beautifully drawn and shaded, amazing. But then I also had screenshots of him represented in game in world of warcraft and in game in heroes of the storm where obviously they have an art style and a polygon limit and that sort of thing is very useful for seeing how talented artists have recreated details at a simplified scale or a simplified manner um it again draws to the silhouette thing the silhouette of the creature is important, not necessarily the exact detail and placement here and there. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. And I, I think I can envision that because what I've experienced and what I've seen other people experience is they, they start building something, but because they, I guess now I understand, they haven't, they haven't like defined the silhouette, they start adding details as they're building and they get lost in the details. And they yeah. don't end up realizing uh, they, they spend so much time in the details that they get burned out and they haven't actually finished that framework. So they don't get that, that oomph. So it almost sounds like you, you really need to do the details last. Yeah. And I, I'm 100% guilty of what you say as well. You know, it's, and there's the reasons why it's the most fun to do the details. It's the most enjoyable and it is very easy to get lost in it. But it doesn't take that long to just frame out the rest of the build in core wood. Super rough. But you just have to know that it's going to end up the right shape. And I would say before letting yourself get lost in the details, make sure that the tricky parts of the build are going to work. And I think for most people, this is where two different roof shapes join each other. That's the most common kind of confusing tricky problem is the width of the building odd or even am i going to need the top centerpiece you need all of those questions answered before you start because if one of those answers comes back mm, this is a problem it's very easy at that stage to make the build one meter wider but if you've already done five hours of detailing you're not going to want to tear that apart and make the building wider. So you're going to carry on and then you're going to run into this roof problem. And I only speak from experience, you know. I mean, roofs, I'm glad you brought up roofs because <laughs> as far as Valheim building goes, it seems that people sort of build from the ground up, right? But then they get to the roof and you they realize, to. ah, these pieces don't, they don't have enough yeah. stability anymore. <laughs> they just break, Yeah. Right? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a big problem, and um, you, you probably notice a lot of my builds don't have roofs. You don't have to build a roof if it's a robot or a dragon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> so th thanks for thanks for answering his question there. That was a great answer. I mean, no I, I, I I really hadn't heard of the silhouette thing before. So now I want to get more into the beginning of your Valheim experience. So. First, could you share what what were your feelings about gaming in general before you ever played Valheim? Like, what, what was your headspace at? What games were you playing? How did you feel about the games that were available to you? Hmm. 
Uh, I've always been a gamer through many genres um, in my very competitive in FPSs, you know, very competitive attitude, that kind of thing, and um, RTS as well, Age of Empires and StarCraft and, and Counter-Strike as far as uh, FPSs go. Um, but then, you know, as I've got older, uh, you tend to feel less competitive about things like that. And whilst they're still enjoyable, I still play FPSs and RTSs and that kind of thing. You also look for that comfort game on, you know, something super chill. I don't have to worry about reflexes. I can go and get a cup of coffee and not going to die or you know, my team's going to lose because of it. Um, and so I was kind of searching around for that for, for quite a while. And a few things took my fancy here and there, but not all games hold your interest for, for a super long time. And before Valheim, I was playing a game called Space Engineers. Um, have you ever, ever heard of Space Engineers? Yeah, I've, I've heard about it, and I think I've seen a little bit of gameplay, but I've never played it myself. It's a wonderful but flawed game. Um, I would say it's, its building is honestly some of the best out there still. Um, I, would, I would put it ahead of both Valheim and Minecraft, like vanilla building, to compare them all. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm going to be biased a little bit there. Uh, but the gameplay side of it, you know, the, the mobs, the creatures, that type of thing, is not fulfilling or rewarding or interesting at all. But the rest of it is fantastic. And what makes it so fantastic is both the tools you have available in creative mode by default. It's like having Infinity Hammer to start with. Um, so that is, is wonderful. And it has a lot of complicated pieces. It has rotors and pistons and timing blocks and computers that can run little scripts and all kinds of crazy things. Um, I was certainly not building anything crazy or groundbreaking in that game back then. Um, you know, I made my own few little designs, but compared to what you can find on YouTube where people have walking mechs and sentinels and all kinds of things, uh, I was certainly nowhere near that level. But that was my building game for a long time. But because of the game, it was only a building game, so to speak. Um, and then Valheim blew up. Uh, and yeah, I was I was aboard that train um, as it as it blew up on Steam, and here we are, much later. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's cool. So you were before Valheim, you were already kind of into building in games. Yeah, I was. Um, I found it. It's not something I even looked for i don't think when when i found space engineers in the first place i think i just someone recommended it to me and you know to start with i played it as it was meant to be played um and got to a certain point and was like mm, the gameplay not great but the building phenomenal and i then spent a lot of time just focusing on the building and then later going to creative mode and, and doing building and types of things there um so when I saw Valheim blowing up and immediately the reviews were saying like, wow, the building's amazing. I was like, I've got to try it. I've got to get involved. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a very interesting time. Uh, interesting. So you didn't play the previous game and originally for the building, but with Valheim, you did. I, I knew at that point I was into building. You yeah. know, I'd found something i didn't expect to find um yeah and and i i did wonder how it would translate over between the two games because it's obviously completely different um scope one is you're in space and doing rockets and that kind of thing and and we're in the viking afterlife now so yeah a different theme and that, that that's that, that's quite interesting because uh it seems that people play Valheim originally for a lot of reasons, but most of them stop playing. However, the people who play Valheim almost like it's an MMO, you know, they keep they put thousands and thousands and thousands of hours into it. Have you 
ever come across anybody like that who doesn't build but plays Valheim all the time? Um, no one that I know. I I see the odd post maybe on on Reddit or whatever with someone saying they have thousands of hours and they're they're just a, an adventurer type player. Um, but you're right. It's ninety nine percent of the time if you've got hundreds and thousands of hours in Valheim, you're a builder at heart. Yeah, or at least server building or something. That, that, that seems to be... Uh, yeah. It's almost as if people... The building is what makes people stay, you know? And at least on, on the servers that I've run, um, whenever I try and do anything about combat, even if it's really cool, like some castle siege or whatever, or some... It, it's almost gimmicky. So, like, people will come and be like, oh, this is cool, but they don't, like, keep coming back week after week after week after week. Whereas when people can get involved in that building process, at least on the servers I've run, that's when those builders are the players who will keep coming back to the server over and over and over again. So just, just a side thing about Valheim. I've always thought it's kind of interesting that Valheim doesn't really make you build like of course you have to get a bed and you know you got to upgrade your weapons and stuff but what what if they sort of integrated the building you know what if the game had some kind of mechanism where to summon a boss you had to build a fort that the boss raids you know these kind of things i'm hoping that maybe in the future something like that will happen because it really does seem that the thing that makes valheim so special like you've said is the building and it's what keeps players coming back so it's just some food for thought. Yeah. I think you're right. So so you started playing and you were interested in building. So can you can you elaborate more on like how did that evolve? Cuz obviously just to let the viewers know, like you ended up being involved in probably the largest Valheim project. At least it's surely the largest Valheim project I'm aware of. Um and that's quite a lot more than just building a dragon you know what i mean that's like really next level so i want to yeah i want to kind of capture that how did you go from the beginning where you joined valheim to to then that what, what was it like at first when you start playing valheim and you're interested in building what happens next well i still have a screenshot somewhere so i can send it to you um of the very first thing i built which was about 10 meters from the world spawn in my first world, which tells you the mindset I went into the game of. It was, I'm looking to see what the building is like. Right and outside the no build zone. New, right outside, yeah. I, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I discovered that the no build thing was there only because I was so eager to try and build something, you know? Um, and the, the thing that you'll see from the picture uh, that should hopefully be inspiring to everyone, is that my first structure was absolutely terrible, square, with a basic roof, no detail, the worst thing you've ever seen. Um, so anyone can do it, is, is what I would hope people take away from that. Um, but that was my first introduction to the building system, the first 30 pieces I placed, um, obviously dying to a tree, as everyone does within the first five minutes of playing Valheim and learning about all these things. So I made my first terrible wooden shack, gathered the first couple of ingredients, made my deer armor and what have you, and set off to find a new place to build somewhere that didn't have this mysterious you can't build here field and somewhere kind of close to the Black Forest, because I'd learned at that point that that was where I needed to go next. And I found a beautiful sloping hill, clear of trees that ran down to the ocean, and I knew that, that rafts were a thing, so I was like, I'm going to need water. So I had this beautiful dream of this tiered city going down with different levels, a long sloping road that ran down to the coast with docks and a shipyard and a workshop and then the long houses at the very top you know i'm sure many people have the same kind of experience and then you start leveling out the terrain for such a thing and run into five fps or you certainly did back in those days um 
you're not really aware of what you're doing and why that's causing a problem. So I carried on and built out this huge thing, which looks amazing in screenshots, but you're you're just five FPS there. And by modern standards, it's not a lot of pieces um, and not a lot of terrain leveling. But the system back then was nowhere near as optimized. But yeah, that was my first probably hundred or so hours in Valheim was gathering stuff from around there in the Black Forest to build this base of stone and wood and thatch. That, that, that seems to match. Uh, my, my understanding is that no matter what Iron Gate does with Endgame and all that, really it just sort of serves as this sort of thing off in the background to make it feel like you haven't done everything yet. But most players, they, they really do just it's meadows, black forest, maybe a little swamp and mountains for the vast majority of them. And I, I, I saw that happen when Ashlands came out. There was all the hype about Ashlands, but then if you look at how people are actually playing, most of them just started playing again, and then they had that same experience you're describing, like getting into it in the black forest in the early parts of the game. So that, that really seems to be the parts that thrive and I want to pick your brain about that because it, it seems that the meadows is the only safe place for building. And maybe mm. what Valheim needs is another safe place. Like, like for example, um, it, you, you really don't find people who build a lot in the further biomes, right? They need so much effort. Mm. And if you see builds in those biomes, they're usually done in creative mode and that sort of thing. Like, especially if you see a build in the Ashlands, the, the actual reality of building on those places, at least on, like, regular Valheim, seems to be prohibitive to people. So I'm wondering, do you think there would be a way to have, like, a Meadows 2? Do you get what I'm saying? Where, like, I do, yeah, that? that's very interesting. Um, I think I think there is a certain degree of charm and interest in a fresh start which does does lend people to enjoy that early meadows and black forest experience but i 100 percent agree that the nature of the biome has a lot to do with it and and naturally like you say because of the challenges of the harder biome it makes building there more restrictive you know you are limited to what kind of builds you can do in the mistlands because of how the terrain is you know you 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 can't build a long expansive great hall because you're gonna have to search for a long time through a lot of mist to find somewhere big enough um and the meadows does not have that problem um the Ashlands also doesn't have a space problem but many other problems which i'm sure everyone's all too familiar with at this point so, could there be a Meadows 2? I mean, the most obvious Meadows 2 place for me is post Deep North. You know, you've beaten the game, you've ascended to Valhalla, you're now in the Promised Land type thing. You know, end scene of Gladiator walking through the crops with your, your hand out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I noticed on, on the server... Because um, it sort of happens because there are some little meadows that spawn like really close to the edge of the world and closer to the Mistlands and that sort of thing. And I noticed on my server, I've been running a server and I get like people to come, play through and leave and I get new people to come and play through and leave. And my thing's always like, how do I keep using the same world and get new players to come and have experiences so that they sort of stumble upon other people's creations. I find that that really adds, it adds a lot mm. to the experience. And what's fascinating is that people find every single meadow, it, it, not necessarily in the center, but when you, when you get to the edge of the world, and it, it starts to be a bit like this with the Black Forest as well, people sort of use them as that meadow. But there is no meadow in the Ashlands. You know, there's very few meadows bordering Mistlands. And if you're not using a map tool, the chance of you finding a safe place bordering Mistlands, uh, you can find Black Forest and that sort of thing. But it, it's definitely tricky. And perhaps in some ways, the plains becomes meadows too. 
because uh, it's so harsh for people. But once you get the hang of it, it's really beautiful, well lit, and open. And as long mm. as you can deal with the death skeeto, then really it's not that problematic, right? But for most players, you know, that's a, a little bit too much. So I'll, I'll share a quick thing that that I that I found. Um, so I did a, a playthrough with in the Ashlands, basically, where instead of a, a vanilla experience, it's a no portal world, and there's basically this path that goes to the Ashlands, and it goes to this. Have you ever seen Attack on Titan? A uh, little bits of it. Yeah, basically, all you need to know is there's a city with huge walls surrounding it, right? Mm -hmm. Impenetrable mm -hmm. walls, so to speak. So I basically did that. I made an area in the Ashlands that is just invincible walls. So enemies okay. literally can't get through. It's impossible. And I found that having that, that safety to go back into, it just enriched the Ashlands experience so much. And it made it, made it so much more approachable for other players because it didn't remove the danger because you still have to go out into the ashlands to, to collect the resources and that sort of thing but there's something about having that safety to fall back to and i have a feeling that that's the thing that mid-game valheim and late game valheim is missing just to get back to your point that mm. um in the meadows and stuff that's the early game experience right so of course, there's always going to be more players in the beginning of the game. That's true for all games. There's no way to change that, right? But I don't think, this is just my opinion, but I don't think it's just that. I think there's a little bit more going on that makes people drop out before the mid-game. And it, it seems to have to do with that lack of a safe place, that lack of safety near the danger. I'm not saying the dangerous yeah. areas can't happen, but what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I really think you're onto something there. And I think maybe it's to do with losing your building. Because if your building gets demolished, it's not like there's a ghost system where you can feed the resources back in and it rebuilds, you know? Like if, if your building got destroyed oh, and that's... all you had to do was come and put the resources back in a box, people I don't think would mind. But because it all comes crumbling down and you've got to spend hours and like you may not even remember how you built something or how it looked, you know, do you want to risk that? Most players don't. Oh, yeah, not at all. Right. <laughs> and, and it's also. Sorry, the... I was just going to say, um, I do not have a problem placing buildings around in the Ashlands because I'm placing things with infinite health. So I don't have that fear at all. And that is the key difference. You know, I don't have to worry about losing stuff for, from enemies or trolls or lava or whatever it might be. But for normal players playing the game in a vanilla way, you can't bear the thought of, you know, teleporting back into your building and everything's collapsing and there's pieces all on the floor. You know, that's the worst nightmare for everyone. Yeah, people just quit. Hmm. It's, it's, it's interesting you bring that up because I found that, uh, so on, on my server is pretty chaotic. Um, I, I do a lot of things that make <laughs> it more chaotic than normal. But what's so fascinating is the people who stayed are like builders who had never really experienced the rest of the game that much. So, so over time, I started changing it so that instead of focusing on the combat people, I focus exclusively on making the server more accessible to the builder people. And I find that that mm. seems to work really, really well, but it's made me aware of sort of an issue. And it's that the builders, believe it or not, the people on my server, this shocked me, they, they want some danger. They want a few things to be destroyed sometimes. The thing is, the raid system produces trolls that just, they don't just destroy a little bit. If you let yeah. a troll roll around in your base, it's going to level the whole thing. You know, yeah. you're going to lose, you lose a couple support beams. You lose the whole second floor of your house, you know? Yeah. And, and it seems that the balance of the danger from the raid system is way overtuned. And that has something to do with why people get so frustrated. Because 
like Iron Gate, I, I get what they're going for with the raid system. I really do because it does get boring if you just build something and there's no threats to it. But it's like those threats, maybe they shouldn't be that extreme, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, the thrill of the first time the ground is shaking happens to you, you know, unmatched. You're like, the ground is what? You know, and suddenly there's three trolls walking towards your base. You're like, oh no, you know, amazing. But when it's happened for the 20th time and you're just like, oh my God, you know, I'm just trying to build this and now I've got to worry about it all being destroyed. It's not fun anymore at that stage. You know, it's just frustrating. Um, and uh, while you were describing that, I was having a, uh, a fond memory, you know, of this, this early days playing the game of having... Uh, I've discovered the ground is shaking and, and learned my lesson and paid for it with all of that. I was at a base and built a terrain moat and I had stakes and everything. You're not getting me in any more surprise raids. You know, when I kill this next boss, I'm, I'm ready for whatever it throws at me. You know, I'm, I'm not falling for that again. So off I go and kill Modo and then, you know, doing other things, smelting some silver. And sure enough, the Modo raid happens. And some hatchlings fly over my base and shoot all of my tamed boars and kill them. Yeah, so, oh no, <laughs> I've got to deal with this for the rest of the game. Yeah, it's uh, it's very frustrating. But that is that is so interesting, you say, that players like a bit of danger. And I can kind of see why in some ways, because a lot of the fun of building a base is building a fortress or a castle or whatever it might be. And that's no fun if no one's attacking it. You know, it's yeah, it's almost yeah, absolutely like you, you were saying something earlier about having a base that enemies then come and attack. I think everyone would love that kind. Of, if that was the raid feature instead, if you know you could activate a ward and it sets off the level one raid, Ike Thea rallies the creatures of the forest and they come and attack your base. If you survive that, you can take the reward, or you can go to level two and then it's the trolls or whatever it might be. I think you could have a much better Yeah, system. so it's like it's uh, the destruction needs to be more consensual. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. I did not consent to this base destruction. Yeah. And I think in some ways they do try and do that. Cause if, at least I've noticed that, like, let's say a goblin gets into your base. Um, it won't, well, as long as it's not from a raid, it's not going to just keep destroying everything. They'll basically, like, destroy one thing and then leave. Um, as long as you're not there, like, to aggro them and keep them coming. Because they'll just keep coming back to you and then resetting the system. But mm. if you're not within their range, I've noticed that the AI does seem to have some system to just attack something once and leave. So it doesn't just wreck the base while you're off cutting wood out in the distance, you know. But but it, it is quite interesting. And I, it's funny you mention that because I'm working on that uh, that trophy raid system. So that's mm. going to be one of the features of the Path of Magic server when, once I launch that. It's still probably a month away or so. But the idea is that, like, the, you don't get any raids. But yeah. the, the moment you put trophies in your base, you start getting the raids for that trophy. Yeah, that sounds really fun. And then, like you say, you have to agree to do it. Or maybe you don't agree because you don't know about it the first time. But then you learn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the idea is like, I mean, the notion that like, ah, oh, you put the troll's head on the wall, and then the other trolls are like, what the hell? And they, they're yeah. still trying to get you, you know? Get him, boys! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So, so let, let's keep going in your, your storyline, so to speak. Um, at this point, you've been playing Valheim, you've built some things, and how does it continue? How does it progress? Are you, so far, you haven't mentioned playing with any other people. Did, did that change yeah. at some point? Um, so I actually started I started out just by myself and I think within the first week I was already decided this this is really fun and I need to get some buddies involved and um, I started playing with two of my friends and one of them dropped out after a little while and then another one kept playing with me and he was not a builder by any means so, you know I think I think he's probably played 
it was probably like 400 hours maybe through that first thing and probably placed less than 50 pieces you know like n never touched the building hammer that was my job which i was completely fine with of course um so we played for quite a long time together but but naturally like we've said you know the the game has a lifespan if you're not into the building it's it would seem so he stopped playing after a while and we'd done everything by then we had done everything that was on offer and there was this was before hearth and home to give people an idea um so at that point i played for a little bit longer in in vanilla survival and had a couple of goals i wanted to accomplish some some buildings i wanted to make and that sort of thing but then i began looking for more um and i'd seen people do this kind of creative mode building with with dev commands or i'm a cheater as it was back then um and the main one who I was really inspired by was a guy called Ghost, um, spelt with a zero and a five instead of an O and an S. Uh, you'll find his, his Valheim videos if you look for Ghost Valheim. And he has, I mean, they're still amazing buildings, but especially for the time period, oh my goodness, to look at these there, they're incredible. So... I began kind of studying what he was doing and trying to work out, okay, how can I do this? Um, and one of the first problems I really wanted to solve was I need to clear this area of trees and rocks and I need to be able to do it faster than chopping down every single one. You know, I don't need the resources because I can build with no cost. We've solved that problem already, but I can't get rid of all this stuff. And I need the ground to be flat. And I need a lot of ground to be flat because I want to build something big. So I went looking for mods. And nothing was really popping up in my searches that seemed like the right thing. And the only mods until that point that I'd used were things with super obvious names of the one function that they did. You know, auto refuel torches. Hmm, pretty obvious what that does. Um... So I was looking for a mod that called, like, Remove Trees or something like that. But every search I tried, I kept seeing Infinity Hammer pop up somewhere on that list. So, you know, after five things with not quite the right tree or rock or flatten coming up, I was like, okay, let me, let me give this a go. Um, and that broke my brain, to put it simply. I I understand. Got it. <laughs> yeah, I, as someone, yeah, you've been through this. You understand. And coming to terms with what it can do is just—it's mind blowing. It, I, I'm pretty sure I didn't play the game for about three weeks uh, the day after I downloaded Infinity Hammer because I'd spent like the three hours after downloading it just trying to come to terms with what was possible with this mod and it, I couldn't, it couldn't compute. And yeah, I, I went and played another game for a few weeks. Um, and then I kind of came back and was like, okay, I need to forget everything I've ever thought about building in this game. I treat it as a completely different game that I'm learning from day one and approach it as if, Infinity Hammer is the game. Uh, so I think I spent like a couple of hundred hours in a test world just trying every single function in the menu and like, no idea what half of these things did. You know, the, the words were meaningless to me at the time, but I, I could see what happened if I turned it on or off. Uh, and sometimes I could figure out what that meant. Um, but... Having done that, I think, was so important for me to then go forward and understand a lot of what this complicated mod can do. And in hindsight, I, I knew a fraction of what I know now, but, but I, could, I could see the silhouette almost, you know? I could see, like, the, the breadth of possibilities that this, this mod could do. And I haven't played the game properly since. So let that be a warning um, if, uh, if you all still enjoy playing the game. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that seems to be a recurring trope with people, actually. I, I get around that by making... Uh, so I, I like have a god character for developing server, 
and then I have mm -hmm. the character that I play on the server with people. And if I don't make a separation, it, it just ruins the, I can't, I can't yeah. feel the limitations, right? So it, but it's funny how all, apparently for me, all, all I needed to do is just make a separate character and then it's fine. It's like when I'm on JP Valheim, I'm just a normal Viking. But the, when I'm on mm -hmm. Overeager Jarl, I, you know, I can teleport, do all this stuff, make anything happen, <laughs> make invincible stuff. And, and it's been really cool, like transitioning in and out of that. But what you're saying makes so much sense because now I can see like, well, that's the beginning of making s a, the RPG server, I would imagine, is if you really fathom what you can do with Infinity Hammer. Because for those of you who don't know that mod, um, the name Infinity Hammer is appropriate. <laughs> it pretty yes. much allows you to build any object in the game and that's just one of its features there are so many features but other things it allows you to do is spawn locations so like you can spawn goblin camps you can spawn boss spawners you can spawn anything in the game and set up your own sort of progression if you have a map seed and it's perfect but it just doesn't have that one boss you can put it there and now with all these other mods yeri has made oh gosh it's it's absolutely incredible how much uh, Yeri in particular has opened up uh, the Valheim world and really enabled people to to do what you've done. I mean, would you have been able to make the RPG server without Yeri's mods? Oh, not a chance. Not not a chance. I mean, I don't I don't think I would have been able to build anything I've done uh, without his his mods. And certainly, a number of them, at least three off the top of my head where I ran into a problem with the build or the video that I wanted to make and could not solve the problem in, in any of the normal means. And I had to message him and be like, you know, is, is this something you can do something about? And a couple of times he's fixed it in like a couple of minutes. You know, he's made like one little change to the code and now I can do the thing that I wanted to do. And I'm, I'm just jaw on the floor at that moment because... I don't pretend to understand what he does, but it's it's magic on a whole different level, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And so if any of you guys are listening to this and you have some extra money and you want to support someone, I strongly encourage you to go to Jerry's... I always mess his name up, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I strongly encourage you to go to Jerry's uh, Buy Me A Coffee page. You can look at the top link of the description in this video. And I don't get anything from it. I don't have any kind of affiliate relationship. But as Dakar mentioned, uh, I, I haven't done what Dakar's done and what, uh, um, what the others have done with the RPG server. But even the things that I've done are only possible with the things that Yere has made available. So I'm very, very grateful to everything that he's done. And if any of you listening are in a position to support um, really, it's worth it. Uh, I, I'm, I give him like some money every month, just a little bit. And these things help uh, because the more tools and access he has, the better the computer is and the more stuff we get. So even if you're doing it for selfish reasons, you should help him out. You should encourage him and support him. It's really worth it. I would definitely second that as well. And even if you're a purely vanilla player, um, that copy piece function that you have now yeah, that, that came from Yera. <laughs> so his, uh, his stuff makes it into the game sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Good times. So, all right. So now let's get into more. It sounds like you had the, the pretty typical experience where one individually, hold on one second. One individually really enjoys Valheim, tries to get some other people playing, but... You know, I had pretty much the same experience as you. I'd play with a friend of mine, and he, he never built anything. He never gave a shit about building. And he was always in a rush mm -hmm. to kill all the bosses and beat the game. Mm -hmm. And I was like, dude, like, can we just like slow down a little bit? <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But that, that seems to be the experience of most Valheimers. So, so what happened next, right? You, you, you mentioned these two people, this group you were playing with, and you sort of got to the end, and then you started using Infinity Hammer, took a break, got back into it. How did that lead to the RPG server? Um, so I then, once I was, I was really familiar with Infinity Hammer, I then decided, okay, now what am I going to build with it? What are the possibilities? And I set about building various different projects and started getting just a, a little bit of 
notoriety on on reddit and that sort of thing um for doing some cool builds and through that i started to meet a couple of people in the community and and um speak to more people and i eventually met uh, nine byte who back then was called tfg but nine byte is uh, the main person i've worked with on the adventure map the rpg map um and he was using Infinity Hammer at the time, but was not like aware of a lot of what it could do. Um, but we got talking, you know, I showed him a couple of things and we had a lot of common interests in different things and became good friends and talked back and forth. And one day he kind of came to me with this idea. He would offer his builds to members of his channel as world downloads. And every now and again, he would get the question, can all these worlds be put into one map? Um, now, of course, it is possible with blueprints and all that to pick up a building, save it, and put it back into a different world. But due to the way Ninebyte had built a lot of his buildings, they were woven into the terrain, and that was all part of it. So just taking it from one seed and putting it onto another is not straightforward at all. Oh, God. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I offer exactly. that service for my players, <laughs> and it's oh, the difference between yeah. a, a one-floor building. It could be the a thirty thousand instance building; it's fine. But the moment you start having like terrain acting as support, even with the tools to copy it, yeah, it is a a huge yeah. pain to get everything to to go in the right place. Yeah, exactly. So the answer was always like no with an ass exclamate uh, with an asterisk sorry you know like no like it's not like but it is kind of possible but a lot of work um so yeah he'd asked me about this and i i explained yeah it's kind of possible but like this 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 and this um so it was kind of like an idea he had you know i want to take a couple of buildings i think that maybe like five tops and just build a little path between them and have a little story and this is this is long before the days of being able to do field edits with world, world edit commands, um, which is the entire backbone of, of how we built the RPG map. Um, so back then, we were only thinking in terms of super vanilla tricks that we could pull off. Um, a couple of them actually made it into the full map, the main obvious one being the yellow exclamation point signs that are over the runestones as our kind of here's a quest indicator that's just done with a yellow exclamation point uh shifted up off of a sign um so some ideas that we had back then you know they were they were pretty good and we knew we could use them but there was nothing in terms of npcs or anything like that i think our best idea at the time was to use like the deer statue as our npc and just have a sign underneath it with with some text um and we weren't thinking in terms of quests or triggers or like none of that was even imaginable at the time. Um, but yeah, it was this kind of idea in the background. And every now and again, I'd find some like piece in the console that acted a weird way if you scaled it. Uh, for instance, there's a, a Diverga wall piece in the console that has a big chunk of invisible hitbox above it. So we had some ideas to do like invisible floor um, with that kind of thing. Uh, and then uh, Yere released the World Edit Commands that, that lets you do things with fields. And again, at, at, at the time, you know, I had no idea what that meant. Uh, but I slowly began to fiddle through the console and see like, oh, you can change this and you can change... and. Within, I think, an hour of me trying it at that point, I'd found so many things that was like, okay, I think we can definitely use that. Oh, we can definitely do something with this. I think Nineby must have woken up to maybe 40 Discord messages that morning with pictures and copy-pasted commands of different things of, we might be able to do this and we can make this invisible and we can edit this runestone text. And then for the next week, we were just silently excited between ourselves like not telling anyone but we were like oh my god we can this changes everything like the scope of this project is now 
a hundred times bigger potentially than than what we thought we could do before. A second um, Infinity Hammer moment. Yeah, it really was. Um, but at that point, I'd used Infinity Hammer enough to to like comprehend it. You know, even though I didn't know every single little field and what they all might do, I I knew enough to know like, oh, there's there's gems out there. You know, we just have to start digging. Um, yeah, it was it was a wild time, um, and this was before the uh, the VWE Discord existed, which is which is Yere's Discord, where we do a lot of this um, world editing discussion. Uh, I think it started shortly after then, and um, that's when I first met uh, Rakar, and he had uh, a lot of handy tips and things with with fields and different things we could use those for so that was definitely a huge help yeah he, um, he pretty much single-handedly got me into ewp i had no idea yeah. about it and i had the same experience you're describing with expand world prefabs like once you realize like wait a second i can make this mm -hmm. vanilla so players don't even know i can alter game yeah. mechanics i can change boss progression i can change any mechanic in the game as long as i yeah. use existing assets it's like yeah holy 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 crap <laughs> yeah uh, yeah, the, the, yeah that's the the kind of unsaid thing that we haven't really said is that all of this works in vanilla which is just it's incomprehensible because some of the things that we can do now required structure tweaks back then which has to be installed you know on client and server and has all those kind of normal mod restrictions so you know, making things invisible was just not possible, even remotely imaginable before this change. And yeah, again, it's just, it's, it's Yere's magical wizardry. I don't know how he does half of what he does. It's insane. Yeah, he's, he's like Rocker with EWP, except with Unity. There's some people yeah. who just know Unity, like, inside out. They, they understand it really, really well. Um, and that, that's the impression I get. And even if you look at how he converses, he's very like short robotic and only says something if it's an absolutely incredibly useful snippet. Of, it's like, you got to shut yeah. up and listen to what he's saying. Cause if he's speaking, it's useful. Yes. Uh, yeah. You couldn't have said it more, more point on like, it's, he always puts things in like the exact, um, terms correct terms like you're reading them from a, a readme uh which is fantastic if you know what he means <laughs> yeah most of the time um, i have to get his answers translated i'll be like yeah. that's cool nice i have no idea what like half of those words mean <laughs> yeah but the fields thing is a perfect example i'm pretty sure he messaged me saying um because i was having I think two days before the Fields thing came out, I had messaged him again with a problem I'd run into with a build, you know, like an unforeseen problem, I kind of call these, where there's just something I could never really have possibly accounted for. And in this case, it was if you make big colored square text on signs at certain camera angles, the signs start flickering. You know, it's like the, a thing you only find out like after you've done it. Um, yeah. So I'd come to him with this problem and I'd figured out like oh, it's only happening at certain distances. Like, is there a way to hide an object depending on distance? Like all this kind of thing. Nah, nah, nah. And he was like, no, I don't think it's possible. Blah, blah, blah. Um, unbeknownst to me, he was already, I think, I think Rakar had actually like, nudged him into this field's direction somehow. I'm not sure on that full story. But yeah, unbeknownst to me, he was already working on this. And then two days later, he drops the fields thing and sends me a message saying in some super precise terms, like you say, oh, you can do this now, which was meaningless to me. But he attached a picture with an invisible sign. So I knew I was interested, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Um, and it's only then through messing around that you kind of learn, like, ah, that's what he means. Yeah, it, it's almost like he's enabled us to combine a love of Valheim with game development or programming. And, like, for me personally, my, like, ultimate dream is to make video games. 
um, and I've mm -hmm. been setting my life up in a position where, I mean, it's such a competitive scene, you know? So my angle is like, I need as many advantages over other people as possible. So I need all the free time. I need to not have financial burden. Uh, you know, <laughs> these are like, how the mm -hmm. hell do you do that? So like, yeah. I moved to Nicaragua, I moved to a, you know, impoverished land and realized all the shit we think about the third world is, is bullshit. And you, you can actually <laughs> live an incredible life. Like my whole life here, I provide for a fiance and everything. And I spend like a thousand dollars a month. It's like unfathomable where I'm from. So, so mm -hmm. I've been working to get all these pieces together so that I can start practicing game development. But what I've come to see that really the, the development part of the game is such a small part of the process. You, you really have to fundamentally know like what experience you're doing and have a way to play test it almost before you yes. develop the game, right? And that yes. is quite tricky because especially if you're developing the game, by the time you develop something, to then change it, it's exactly like you were describing earlier. You have to have the silhouette. You have to know mm -hmm. ahead of time. Otherwise, you're, you're not going to want to redo the whole system just so it works exactly the way it needs to. Um, and for me, what, what is happening now is I see that, you know, okay, I have some players. I have a small YouTube channel. I can get people to play these mechanics. And if I had my own game... It would take weeks, months, maybe even years for me to get to the point from idea to feedback from players in actuality, right? Whereas with Expand World Prefabs and Valheim and these tools that uh, Yare has made, it's, you can literally, I can like have an idea, get some help with the Valheim world editing, scripting stuff, and then put it on the server, have people playing on it, and get feedback within a day. It's like a 24 hour mm -hmm. feedback loop. And I, I'm putting this together and I'm like, holy shit, this is it. I, I, I'm not saying this is gonna be my game. This is how I can get all the numbers right. This is how I can learn how many times when you kill something, is it acceptable to get a nice drop from it and it still feel good throughout the whole game? How do you figure out those exact percentages? You know, Because there's a huge difference mm -hmm. between 10%, 1%, a tenth of a percent, a hundredth of a percent. And the only yeah. way to get those numbers right is through playtesting. So, so mm -hmm. it's, it's just absolutely shocked me. And it's one of the reasons I'm so fascinated by what you, you, you and Ninebyte and the other people in the team have done. Because it's, you've, you've made a game in the game. And so, so, so now could you, could you share what that's like? You don't have to get into like how it started. But people who are listening at this point, um, I'd say they, they're probably interested in checking out the, the adventure map. Um, and learning more about it and if they haven't already played on it, right? So, so could you mm -hmm. sort of tell, tell us what, what, what it ended up turning into and, and like what, what, what do you want them to know about it? Um, <clears throat> well, just, just to like quickly uh, respond to your, your comments, um, it is a huge challenge, like you say, and something that we did not plan enough in hindsight going in um you know doing this kind of thing for the first time we didn't we didn't know what we didn't know you know we we did to some extent have have an idea and of, of planning it but yeah not not as much as we should have done and the big advantage we had is that knowing what things we could and couldn't change to the game helps lay out our framework you know, we knew we couldn't really change like the order of the boss progression. So that lays a pretty solid structure on any kind of framework of game design we're going to go around. Um, so that was, you know, a limiting factor for us, but also very helpful in guiding things the right way. And yeah, if you're if you're starting from scratch, uh, it's, it's a whole different uh, um, nightmare trying to balance everything. Um, so yeah, we, we did have a lot of planning going in and we knew that there were things that were sort of defined in terms of when you would get certain weapons and armor. Um, so something we kind of went and went through the list of all the weapons and put them in a kind of, uh, order of when you get them in the normal game and then roughly kind of said, okay. So that's kind of going to be some rough order of where you get them. 
Now, do any of those match thematically with the locations? Or maybe we want to put the coolest weapons, you get those from the boss. So the porcupine is from the boss, but maybe the black metal sword, that's not quite as interesting, even though it's the same tier. So you get that from a location instead of the boss. Um, we went through and did that kind of thing for all the weapons and armor. And we knew it wasn't going to be perfect at that stage, but it gives us a good place to start with. And I think that was very important because otherwise it's so overwhelming, you're never going to start. You're going to spend so long thinking about what maybe you can do and maybe this won't work and all of that. Um, so, yeah, getting it at least somewhat roughly correct. Uh, there's, there's a thing... Nine by and I talk about often, which is the eighty twenty rule. And if you, if anyone's not heard of that, you you can Google that and and uh, find out more about it. But it it roughly says that you can do not do the full job and get most of the results. You know, as long as you do mo a little bit of the job, you will get most of the result from it. And it's only the last little bit that needs most of the work to do. So. That was our starting point. And then it just became about playtesting. And we knew, again, the things we can't change are the amount of damage that weapons do. But we can change the amount of health creatures have. So that was our balancing mechanic. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was kind of the core of different things. And from then, that gives us an idea of what kind of challenge can the player face at this point? Um, what creatures can they and can't they take on? And referring to things like, okay, they're in the planes gear at this stage. They have the padded iron, they have the black metal sword, etc. They can defeat a level one fulling, not a problem. So that means I can take a gray dwarf and give him like as much health as a fulling, and they should be able to defeat this guy like pretty easily because he's got worse AI than the fulling. So yeah, that that gave us a really good like scaling for making the custom mobs and and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's awesome. So so let's say someone wants to. Uh, I'll, I'll actually have to end this pretty soon. Uh, the next call starts yeah. in fifteen minutes. So okay, sure, sure. So. Let's say someone wants to uh, either find what you've worked on or like see what you've done. How how can they f not not necessarily get in touch with you, but like is there a, a page you want to direct them to? I can put it in the the link in the video. Anything in mind? Sure. So I have a, a YouTube channel where you can see some. Of, uh, sorry, excuse me. So I have a YouTube channel that you can find. Uh, I go by Dakar on YouTube. You can see my, my builds and uh, the video I have about the adventure map. And then I have uh, a Discord server as well. And you can also find me in, in the VWE world editing server if uh, you're interested in, in that side of things. Um, and yes, for the adventure map, you can download that from either my Discord server or Ninebytes Discord server as well. Uh, you'll find links and instructions and FAQs and all that sort of thing um, for downloading the map and installing. And yeah, if, you wanna, if you've not heard of this before and want to get a taster, uh, I'd encourage you to go and watch um, probably Ninebytes' video first, uh, his first video on the topic, and, and then give mine a watch. I can put the Ninebytes video as the end screen element. So they show up. They 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 can just click awesome. on that. And if there's uh, if you think he or they or she or whatever would have any chance any interest in doing one of these interviews, then feel free to reach out to them and let me know if they they express any interest. I'm I'm always yeah, keeping an eye out for a anybody really who who wants to come on the channel and speak publicly about Valheim and their love for the game. Um, I found that. Doing these kind of interviews is um, really beneficial for communities. It helps people network and get to know each other better. And in the past, uh, I did this for uh, a different thing, totally different thing, nothing to do with games. Mm -hmm. and it was it was amazing. So I'm trying to do that same thing with Valheim. Just talk oh, no. to as many people as possible who want to talk about the game 
and uh, really expand my own horizons. And y you've also been very helpful to me in the, the Discord whenever I have issues and things I'm trying to learn. So, so I, I really appreciate your time and thanks so much for participating. No, that's no problem at all. Yeah, I, I like I said at the start, I love helping people and uh, letting them realize what they want to make, you know. Um, yeah, that's awesome. So to those of you who are watching, if you want to check out the server or the RPG server or the adventure map, then you can check out the end screen element of this video. It'll be nine bytes introduction, I think it is, to the server. It'll show you some overview of it. And if you're interested in any more Valheim content, just like this video or any other video about Valheim and YouTube will start dishing out more Valheim videos. I'm excited to do more of these calls as well. So if you want to be interviewed or you have somebody who you believe would like to be interviewed about Valheim, then just reach out to me. You can get in touch with me by commenting on the YouTube channel or by going to email at Jack Pittman Nika. That's J-A-C-K-P-I-T-M-A-N-N-I-C-A -N -N at gmail.com. So thanks for watching everybody and have a great day.